while we're waiting for our high-speed technology to catch up with the talking, uh, welcome everyone. This morning is another beautiful and sunny day, and we're looking forward to uh, just a wonderful sermon and a wonderful time together. So, when Jackson gives me the high five, we'll be ready. <laughs> we're ready.
Happy Sunday. Welcome to church. Best day of the week. Uh, not too many announcements this week. We are still having regular Wednesday night Bible study in the Fellowship Hall on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Be on the lookout through your email and through the website for our annual meeting. This year will be virtual. So that'll be coming up the next week and we'll send everybody the Zoom ID. But everybody can be there because it's virtual. So we get to see the inside of everyone's house. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you very much. Let us pray. As you bow in prayer, become aware of whose presence we have entered. It is not so much that we have asked God to come among us, because there is not a place we can go where God is not. So it is we who come into God's presence. And as you come, feel God's welcome. As you come, feel the grace of God. And even as you think about the week that just passed, do not come with apprehension. Even as you recall conversations you had that you shouldn't have had, 
come because God knows you. And as we as Americans and Christians recall the events of last week, we might feel it presumptuous of us to ask God to bless America. And we might be right, at least today. Because the words of a hymn writer might be more appropriate so let us pray those words with that hymn writer, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclothe us in our rightful minds. In purer life, your service find in deeper reverence, praise. Drop your still dues of quietness, till all our strivings <laughs> cease. Take from our souls the, the strain and stress, and let our reordered lives confess the beauty of your peace. Breathe, breathe, O oh God, through the heats of our American desires, thy coolness and thy balm. Let sense be dumb. Let flesh and power seeking retire. Speak through the earthquake, wind and fire. O oh, still small voice of calm. And as we allow God's forgiveness to wash over us, even if we were not present and or culpable in the sins in the nation's capital last week, yet we come needing God's forgiveness. So receive it. Receive it for the rash decisions, the lapse in wisdom, the broken relationships that we broke. And as God forgives us now, let us pledge to forgive others as we have also already been forgiven by God. And now with the week ahead, as you see yourself as God sees you, commit into the hands of God yourself the week ahead. And pledge to be an instrument of peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Let us learn afresh how to give. Give of ourselves. Give a greater honor to others than ourselves. For in doing so, we not only receive, but we act the life of Christ in a world that is corrupted by self-seeking, power-seeking, both of which bring destruction. So, Lord, as we worship you today, refresh us with the life of your Son, and with the power of your spirit, and remind us that we have now been re-energized as your agents in the world, agents of peace, agents of love, 
agents of possibility and agents of joy to the glory of your son Jesus Christ and in his name we pray amen and amen I greet you again in the name of our Lord Jesus and in the name of the Spirit who gives us life and encouragement. I want to thank uh, the musicians who have uh, prepared us adequately for worship and uh, our sister Elena who has welcomed us. I endorse the welcome and it is good to see all of you. Last week we uh, last Sunday, we weren't quite yet at uh, Epiphany. Uh, it crept up on us during the week. And so I'm grateful to Mike for remembering that and for uh, giving us a last touch of the Christmas story uh, that we 
couldn't have had exactly last week uh, the, the, the visit of the Magi, uh, which that musical piece uh, captured. Uh, today, uh, on the Christian calendar, uh, most churches would be thinking about the baptism of, of Jesus, but uh, I am so grateful for that piece of music, uh, both pieces of music uh, 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 that uh, remind us that we, we really go through Christmas too quickly and we leave it too soon. Uh, with 4,000 deaths per day from the COVID pandemic, more people really should begin to respect this disease and the ravages that it brings to not just us here in this country, but worldwide. It's a deadly virus. And those of us whom it has not killed, it has left devastated. Loss of jobs, loss of businesses, loss of the ability to sing and to hug. I, I can't tell you when last I greeted somebody with a handshake. And that little thing robs me of enough memories of my father who has been long gone for over 30 some years because he was the one who taught me how to shake a hand, not to shake a hand, but how to shake a hand. Amen. And every time I shake a hand, I remember him. This thing has robbed us. But there is a disease that is much more deadly than COVID-19. And it's a disease called sin, of which the Bible says its wages are death. And even if you ditch the Bible, or you find an atheist who rubbishes it, even he or she would agree that the experiences of humankind, the history of humankind, tell, tells us clearly that sin ultimately, or sometimes immediately, does lead to death. And so today I want to begin with you uh, a sermon series that I entitle Healing Stories, and they would mostly come from the gospel according to St. Luke. There's enough of them there, and I might be led to go uh, a couple of other places from time to time, uh, but today we begin that series, and it is appropriate to begin with the most deadly disease that requires the most invasive healing of all, that disease called sin. And so I want to read for you from a passage of scripture in Luke's gospel, chapter 4, verses 1 to 13, from the New International Version. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all, the, uh, all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. 
For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Healing stories. And today we consider a cure for our worst disease. I'm not a physician. I am married to a healthcare professional, but I'm not one. And uh, she probably chose well because she chose the sickest guy of all, but anyway. But I do know that a virus is not an illness. Uh, the virus is not the disease. The virus causes a disease when it enters its human host. The virus is the virus. And so long as it stays far from us, it is not the disease. It is what it causes in us that is the disease. And in this text that I have read, we see Jesus being tempted. And like the virus, which is not the disease, temptation is not the sin. The temptation is the temptation. But once it is allowed to enter the human host, it becomes sin. And as long as it contaminates the human spirit, it becomes the illness of sin. And so today I want to share with you two steps towards dealing with the sickness of sin, dealing with the illness that temptation causes that we call sin. Two steps. The first is to recognize our vulnerability to the virus of temptation. And the second is to resist the valance of the virus. The first Recognize your vulnerability to the virus, the virus of temptation. Not even Jesus escaped temptation. We had a little debate on Wednesday night about the humanity versus the divinity of Jesus in a certain situation where his humanity was patent and clear. And it is also patent and clear here, for in his humanity, he was subjected like you and me to temptation, but clearly did not give in and remained without sin. So we have to recognize that we aren't superhuman, as some people think they are and have inconvenient experiences arising from that fallacious assumption about themselves. You notice how, if I could jump the gun, each of the temptations began with if. If you are, if you think you are, who do you think you are? And whenever people assume about themselves things that either are true about them, but they feel they have to prove to somebody. If you live your life trying to prove anything to anybody, you have a miserable journey ahead. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. Once you know who you are, and worse if you think you are something that you're not, and therefore feel 
you're compelled to try to prove it to others. That is the biggest temptation of all that gives you the hardest fall of all. So, so, so this text gives us an insight into how trouble comes at us and how sin is always knocking at your door. Recognize your vulnerability to the virus. Watch this, that, that that virus of temptation always seeks to take control of us. And it always seeks control of us through three natural portals in the human being. First, our appetite, then our ambitions, then our attitudes. All of us have appetites. All of us should have ambitions and do. We're created to have them in the first place. Just to be able to wake up in the morning and breathe is an ambition. And to be able to be alive at the end of the day is an ambition. And all of us are built for attitudes. And temptation seeks to come into us, like the virus seeks to come in us through our nostrils, through our mouths, through our eyes, through ourselves. So too does temptation seek the softest places, our appetites, our ambitions, and our attitudes. So we watch these temptations. The first was targeted at Jesus' appetite. He was in the wilderness after his baptism for 40 days, fasting. And of course, as a human being, he would be very hungry at the end of it. And the devil comes. Now, I, I'm, I'm not going to take the time to, to deal with the whole thing about the devil. Um, I, I'm sure that none of us has ever met the devil. Uh, uh, and, and that should give us a clue about whether this thing called the devil is meant to be understood as an embodiment or as a wider sense of temptation so invasive, so pervasive, that wherever we go, there is <laughs> the devil. Uh, but I, I, I won't get into that now. I only have a few minutes. And it could become controversial. But suffice it to say, Jesus was tempted. And, and if I were to go into that argument that I just said I wasn't going to get into, we would have to consider the real possibility that, that evil is not just pervasive and invasive, but it is always with us, inside of us, ready to push us. You know, when Paul writes to the Galatians, he says, there are two natures in us. The flesh and the spirit, and they're fighting with each other. They're always at war with each other. And the, 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 the natural nature is the one that is most susceptible to temptation. But also, so is the spirit. Anyway, Jesus is tempted in his appetite. He was hungry. There would be nothing wrong with eating, turning the stones into bread, but except that he would be ceding his control to the devil. And he would be acting in obedience to a temptation that would deflect him from his purpose at the moment. His purpose at the moment was to push himself physically so that he would be prepared spiritually and ready for the world that was ahead of him for the three miserable years that were going to come upon him. How could he yield to the physical at that crucial point and not sin? So the idea was to take control of him through his appetite. What about the second temptation? All the kingdoms of the world never seem to have forgotten that, and, and if you think about Jesus wrestling with himself, here is the man, he knew who he was, he knew what he had come into the world for, 
and, and he knew that the end of it was going to be a, a cross. Remember in the garden, as he was confronted with it, in the, in the moment it was about to, 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 to dump on him, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Look, in the very beginning, he, he was, if this is a, a wrestling in himself, yeah, these kingdoms, man, I could have this thing without, without going to the cross. The ambition. But he resisted. And then that third temptation, where the temptation seeks to take control of him through his attitude. If you are the son of God, on the highest place of the, 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 the temple, jump, jump. And this, you know, the devil now starts to, to, put, to put to him the technique that Jesus put to him. Each of the first two was, listen, it is written, it is written. The devil says, okay, okay, he's, he's beating me at it now. Uh, 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 I tell you what, this third temptation, let me put to him what is written. Jump, because it is written. Now, this tells you how, how easy temptation can come at us even when we're reading the word. I mean, I mean, look at how many people do evil things because God told them to. And it's not just Muslims, radical ones who do that. And I know many Muslims who don't do that. And I'm prepared to call those such people not Muslims, just as, as I am prepared to, to call such people who call themselves Christians and do that not Christian. But that's another argument, that's another sermon. Amen. <laughs> but the, the, the temptation is jump. Well, if Jesus had given into that, he ought to have broken his neck. And he would have deserved it. The attitude was... I am not full of myself. I don't need to prove anything to you. If the opposite had happened, oh, so you doubt who I am, let me show you. I'll jump. And as a human being, something bad would have happened. Look, I don't have the time to work this thing through. I don't know if we'll come back on Wednesday night to the same passage and wrestle with it. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll see how I feel about it. But, but this is just in passing to, to remind us that we are vulnerable to the virus called temptation. And in order to deal with this perennial sickness that is worse than COVID-19, more deadly than anything the world has ever seen, the first of two steps is to recognize your vulnerability to the virus of temptation. The second step is to resist the valance of the virus. Now, the only reason I know what a valance is is that I'm married to a woman <laughs> who keeps a house and, uh, you know, puts up curtains and wants me to climb up to put the valance <laughs> so that all those curtain rods that you see exposed around our building would be covered with another curtain that's frilly and beautiful, and that's the valance. <laughs> the valance is meant to hide the rugged, ugly, if you could, I'm not saying these are ugly, but to, to, <laughs> to, to hide, to hide the, the curtain rods so that, so, that, so that the whole thing would look much more beautiful. Each one of these temptations was a valance, or a valance, which is, uh, I think, the better pronunciation. Each one of them was pretty, but beneath all of them was the venom, the viciousness, the full extent of the virus, ready to take Jesus down when each one of them was promising to take him up. One well, of these days, depending on how long I am here with you, we'll get to, 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 to Luke chapter 15, where a young man, you know, came to his father and demanded stuff and went out thinking he was going to live his life up. <laughs> when at the end he ended up in a pigsty living his life down. That's 
what we need to resist. And so in resisting the violence of the virus, there are three little steps we need to consider. First, keep the distance between the necessary and the expedient. Not everything that clamors, do me, do me now, is necessary. A, a hungry man, 40 days without food, eat me, eat me now. No, he's going to take his time. It's expedient, but it's not necessary. I'm on a fast, and I must complete it in order to be strong for the mission ahead. Second, know the difference between upward mobility and the downward slide. That's the temptation of the world. I'll give you the world, but you would lose your soul. So it's a lesson that, that Americans still need to learn. Americans who love power, Christian Americans, or Americans who call themselves Christians, who aren't satisfied with the servant power of Jesus, but want the political power of the world, and will do all kinds of nonsense to get it and grab it and lose their soul. Resist the violence of this virus. Resist it by keeping the distance between the necessary and the expedient. Because the lines can get blurred very easily. Learn the difference and keep the distance between it. Know the difference between, the up, between upward mobility and a downward slide. Not everything that promises to take you up will take you up. It will take you down hard and fast. Ashley Babbitt, a 35-year-old young woman, I don't know whether she flew from California or drove from California, is now dead. Looking for upward mobility and bam, in a moment she was dead. Unnecessarily. I am as annoyed with her as I grieve for her. Resist the violence of the virus. And then the third step is to kill the dissonance between what you say and what God says, between what somebody says and what God says. There's, there's this dissonance, the noise, when what you want begins to shout and it begins to sound after it shouts long enough and you listen to it long enough, oh, this is the voice of God. When the devil says, I'm tempting you, and I'm tempting you with your own words, it is written, he will send his angels to guard you, so jump. Look, friends, the time is gone. <laughs> and unless you've been living under a rock, we, we know the events that happened in the U.S. Capitol last week. And I've been asking myself, what, what did we see? What did we see last week? Did we, did we see a display of what happens when people yield to temptations? Did we see in real time people be, being uh, uh, invaded by the virus of temptation and being totally controlled by that virus of temptation? totally con controlled through their appetite, their appetite for power that they shouldn't have had either at all or in the way they were seeking it or at the time they were seeking it or through the people they were seeking it or for the purposes for which they were seeking it? Were they controlled by this virus through their appetite? Did we see people being controlled in real time through their ambition for positions and for claims that was not theirs to claim, positions that was not theirs to claim. Did we see in real time? 
people being controlled through their attitudes, an attitude of pride, that there is no truth and no reality except the ones that we know, except the ones that we have created. And every other perspective is rubbish, for we know the truth. For we have created the truth, you see. Pride, an attitude that invites the virus in its full onslaught. Did we see in real time people who didn't keep the distance between the necessary and the expedient? Did we see in real time people who did not know the difference? between truth and falsehood? And did we see in real time people who did not kill the dissonance between what they wanted and what God wanted? Well, my friends, the answer to these questions are blowing in the wind, the wind of the spirit. I will let him answer those questions for you because I shall not.
not to wrest the power from any other power, not to set himself up as king, not even to overthrow the Roman government, but who came as a servant and who came to demonstrate that the power in love exceeds the power of the sword and the power even of the people. That night, before his crucifixion, that power in Jesus came crash, crashing with the power that Judas sought and with whom he was in cahoots. And while the power of Judas seemed to have won through his betrayal and through the power of those with whom he worked. Nevertheless, three days afterwards, the power of Jesus was manifest in his resurrection and remains so ever since. And so as we come to this table once more, it is to remind us at a time like this, where the real power is and where the real service is. And so let us be sure that we join Christ represented in one loaf and in many parts we now are the body of Christ. The night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. Take it and eat. Let us eat as the body of Christ. the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. There is power in the blood. Let us drink together and share in that power, the power of Christ in us now in the spirit. Let us drink together. us moments from now to continue worshiping you in the life we live, in the words we say, in the thoughts we entertain, in the power that we wield, in the power that we seek, in the power that we share, in the power that we resist, so that the virus of sin, the virus that leads us to sin, would not enter us, but we would become managers and victors over it. So send us from this place now with your power, with your blessing, with your healing, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 